Good morning. Good morning, one and all. It's great there's some really good conversations happening there, but we might start our service and we'll continue those great conversations at morning tea once we're completed. Well, as I said, good morning. My name's Jamie, for those that don't know me, uh, which means that you are a visitor to uh, join us here in church this morning. If that's the case, a very special welcome to you. I hope you're enjoying Gunnedah if you're here for some time away during school holidays. 84 days till Christmas. Wayne wasn't here, I was going to ask him, only because I knew. But uh, 84 days till Christmas and we're in October already. And for those who enjoy rugby league, there's a game on tonight, they tell me, at 7.30. I think it's the grand final. And I think it's Parramatta and it's Penrith. So if you're a supporter of either of them, good luck. If you're like me and a supporter of Western Suburbs, and they come last, you're not even interested in tonight's game, so. Uh, this morning, Simon, our senior minister, will be uh, leading our sermon. Um, we'll also have Amelia doing our Bible readings. Jane Mack will be praying for us as, and also delivering the mission spot. And uh, all our music will be recorded. And David and Tim up the back are helping out uh, with our sound and computer today. So why don't we be all upstanding for our first song? And join in, uh, rejoice the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. Jesus the Saviour reigns, the God of truth and love. When He had purged our stains, He took His seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. Rejoice in 
Please be seated. Please uh, bow your head as I open in prayer. Lord, we give praise that you are a gracious and forgiving God. Your words guide us as we stumble and your forgiveness strengthens our faltering knees. I pray that our time together in your word this morning will reach our questioning minds and hearts as we deal with life's challenges each day. Lord, through your word, continue to grow your church family closer together so that we, your servants, can confidently share your message throughout our community at every opportunity and also to support each other. I pray that our minds will be silenced from the week that's passed and the week that is to come so that your word will be heard above all. Amen. Well, this morning, um, we're going to join together to recite a psalm, Psalm 37. And you'll see uh, on the screen, I'll um, get you to join in in the white as we go along. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your, make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Well, today's theme is radical response. And one of our Bible readings you're going to hear shortly is Matthew 7. I'll just read two verses, Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Well, this is an awesome passage of scripture. It's very easy to visualise two gates, one easy to pass through, one not so easy to pass through but only one leads to a life with Christ. Well, after reading this, my mind wandered and I come to the point where I thought, what would my be life, life be like if I hadn't met my wife? If I hadn't gone down that pathway, obviously the wrong pathway, what if we hadn't have got married? What would my life be like if I hadn't have gone down the pathway of finding Christ? Well, I wouldn't have known the two loves of my life. But lucky for me, that wasn't God's plan for me. I wonder what pathways are in front of you today? What gate will you open? Something to consider when we come to today's sermon. It is right that we must be centred in God's word through the Bible as we seek to gain in the knowledge each time we gather together. Now Amelia is going to come and read from the Bible. The first reading today is Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. This can be found on page 936 of the Pew Bible. 937, sorry. Haggai chapter 1 from verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. 
You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains of ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labour of your hands. The second reading today is Matthew chapter 7, and it's from verse 13 to 27. This is page 961 on the Pew Bibles. Starting from verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out (coughs) demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who, does, who hears the words of mine and does not put them into action, into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew a beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as a parish, there are many missionaries that we support um, serving right around the world, and now Jay Max is going to come and give us an update on just uh, some of those missionaries. Morning. Well, this morning we're having an update on the Newmans in Uganda. So I thought we'd start with a little quiz, a little bit of trivia. Um, so, does Uganda have a prime minister or a president or both? So, hands up if you think a prime minister, a president, both? Both is correct. The capital city of Uganda, is it Kampala? Or Nansana? Hands up for Kampala. Hands up for Nansana. You guys are very clever. It's definitely Kampala. The estimated population of Uganda in 2021 was 46 million or 13 million? Hands up for 46 million. Hands up for 13 million. It's 46 million. 13 million is the population of Rwanda, in case you were wondering. And what percentage of the area of Uganda, of that whole country, is water? Is it 2% or is it 15%? Hands up for 2%. Hands up for 15%. It is 15%. It's got the second largest inland freshwater lake in the world. Um, And the largest religion in Uganda, Christianity or Islam? Hands up for Christianity. Hands up for Islam. In their census of 2014, 85% of the population 
said they were Christian. Um, but CMS tells us there are many Christians in Uganda, but there is a widespread lack of biblical depth where Christians are vulnerable to false teaching, such as the prosperity gospel. So the Newmans, they're in Uganda, um, which is about halfway down the East African continent. Uh, half, it's in East Africa, halfway down the continent. Um, and they, they're in Rukungiri, um, which is on the southwestern edge of Uganda. So lately, they've had their first in-person visit from CMS in June, and then they had an Aussie team from the Armadale Diocese and some people from Sydney in July, which included Nick Stone from Boggy and the, the France family from Walker. This team helped run a conference there with them. The Newmans are thankful for the heartwarming and invigorating partnership in the gospel with so many, both in Uganda and in Australia. They are thankful to God for the teamwork of the college community in farewelling their retiring principal, Shadrach, and for giving students endurance to complete their final semester exams. Margie and Andrew picked up COVID in the last week of their semester in late August, but they are thankful to God for keeping them safe. And they have a six-month home assignment back in Australia starting in November. They've asked us to particularly pray for the students as they return to their parishes from this conference and for energy for them for the work that they have to do this month at the Bible College. So let's pray for them now. Father God, we bring before you Margie and Andrew. We thank you for them and for the work they are doing, partnering with so many in Uganda. We pray that they and those they work with would continue to keep the main thing, the main thing, Jesus. We pray for the students as they return to their parishes, that they will choose to be good shepherds of your people. We ask that they would be true to your word, caring for the people entrusted to them and honouring to Christ. We pray for energy for Margie and Andrew as they mark exams and spend time on curriculum development this month. We pray for Margie and Andrew with their home assignment approaching. Father, we thank you for this gift of this home assignment and its timing. We pray that they would finish up well over the next few weeks. We pray for a time of deep encouragement while they are back, and we pray that you would bless their time with family, friends, and supporters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jane. Now, kids, it's time to come down the front for Kids Spot, and Simon's going to sing. Well, they're going to sing with me, I hope. <laughs> It's a kid spot, literally, as in singular. All right, that means the adults have to um, really lift your game then and sing with me. So, I hope the words are up there. Okay, yep, this is a Collins song. Um, you've got to do what the Lord say. The words will be up there. I don't know about any actions, um, but, but sing it along um, with me. I just practised this this week, so if I stuff it up, Sorry about that. So. Well, if you love the Lord, you can sing and shout. And if you love the Lord, you can dance about. But if you love the Lord, well, you better obey. Because you've got to do Love the Lord, well you better obey, 
think there's just sheets for the kids today. <laughs> up, straight away, yep. Up the back there, yep. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we have the scriptures in front of us. Father, we thank you that they are our rule for life. I pray, Lord, that what we do today, what we listen to today, may encourage us to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So it might be helpful to have your Bible open um, in Luke chapter 7. And I'm going to begin today with a disclaimer. Matthew chapter 7, I should say. So thank you for being awake, just testing you. Um, so I'm going to begin with a disclaimer. Um, so a disclaimer is uh, a statement that de denies responsibility for what's coming next. So I'm actually going to take responsibility for the words that I say. Um, but I started like this because the end of the Sermon on the Mount like the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, is quite confronting. So if you recall, um, the Sermon on the Mount begins in chapter 5 um, very gently with the Beatitudes, which is a beautiful part of the Bible. But it ends here in chapter 7 with some very tough words. The Sermon on the Mount begins um, with grace, which is the gift that God gives us. Those, the blessings are a gift to us. And it ends here... Um, with three warnings. Now, in the end, none of the Sermon on the Mount is actually easy. In fact, if you have found the Sermon on the Mount easy, then I suggest that you go back and read it again and read it a little bit more thoughtfully. You see, the Sermon on the Mount isn't uh, teaching us that there's some kind of intellectual ascent that we need to make um, in our faith. It's not a list of um, suggestions either for how we might live our lives. It's actually a call to a very radical type of obedience to God. It's a call for Christians to recognise that they are to be distinct in the way they live their life. Or, as Jesus said, um, to be salt and light living in the world. So I wonder how carefully um, you've listened to the Sermon on the Mount. At the Sermon on the Mount, I think the last part here is particularly confronting um, for Jesus' disciples. I think if we follow the flow of the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus' teaching is now over and what he's doing for his disciples <clears throat> is asking them to make a decision about who they're going to follow. Um, will we uh, be part of the kingdom of God, for example, or will we be part of the kingdom of Satan? Will we dis, um, seek uh, delights and comforts from the culture that surround us, surrounds us? Uh, or will, be, will we be um, people who live radically in a Christian counter-culture? Well, I hope you'll be able to see by the end of today why it's so confronting. And I've split it into the three sections which you find in your Bible. Um, and we're going to start with the two gates. Jesus begins that section by saying, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Well, it shouldn't surprise you if I tell you um, that Jesus believes that his teachings are the exclusive way to life. Well, in what sense is that true? Well, Jesus is the narrow way. Jesus is the gate to life. How do disciples of Jesus enter the life that Jesus is calling them to? Well, you enter through the narrow gate. It is the gate of grace the gate of obedience, the gate of Jesus Christ. 
How do disciples continue in the way of Jesus? Well, they continue by following the path that comes from that gate. And that is the obedience that comes from faith. That is, that comes from trusting the Lord Jesus. The wide road, well, life outside loyalty to Jesus, is full of an alluring width of moral temptations and of permissions to live a full life. The wide gate and the road that goes from it is a path of whatever pleases you. It's the path where, for example, God is only love and not obedience. On the other hand, though, we have the narrow gate, and that is where the life of a disciple of Jesus passes day by day, hour by hour, week by week, through the narrow gate that makes Jesus Lord of every part of your life. The disciples of Jesus walk the uneasy way of obedience. You could also say that discipleship is the equivalent of the moral minority. The life of a disciple of Jesus is the life of a person who takes Jesus, as we've read about him in the Sermon on the Mount, with a very final and severe seriousness and decide to follow him every step of the way. For our purposes today, that way is not just the narrow way, it is the path to salt and light. Let's turn then to the next section, which is the two prophets. Uh, Just two small quotes from there. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognise them by their fruit. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. So in the two gates uh, section, we're separated Um, from what we might call the moral majority or the worldly majority by committing ourselves to discipleship and the lordship in Christ and the lordship of Christ. Here, we're separated from those in the Christian community, although they look impressive and uh, apparently effective, they are, in the end, nevertheless, false. Uh, Jesus explained a moment ago that the narrow way is hard and if we're to enter the narrow way then we will need good guides, truthful guides. We need to be able to discern the Christianity, uh, sorry, able to discern the difference between Christianity that lives in the shadows and the Christianity that lives in the flesh of those who are converted. The first subtlety of a bad guide is that they can appear to be Christian. So that often means for us then, the greatest danger is not necessarily persecution, but false prophets. When we read this though, we shouldn't be in despair because we're not helpless before false teachers. Jesus says here, you'll recognise them, doesn't he, by their fruit. Now fruit here is not um, meaning their acts of success, Um, It actually means the whole course and tone of their life. Their track record, I suppose, if you like. So when we get to a test of a false prophet, the first test is that one of doctrine. So do they encourage faith in Christ alone? The narrow gate. Or do they encourage faith in something else? Or even faith in anything else? The second test, then, is the ethical test. Do these teachers, 
uh, teach or evade, make important or unimportant? Do they live on the road or off the road of Jesus' hard commands in the Sermon on the Mount? Do they teach, for example, love without cost, a relationship with God without obedience? Do they teach the love of God without the fear of God? Sadly, there are many in the church who claim to be faithful Christians, but we will recognise that they are false by what they say and what they do. And of course, very sadly, there have been many prominent Christians who have proven that not all who claim that Jesus is Lord know Jesus as Lord. If God is present, then God will be feared. If God is loved, then the love of God will cost. If Christ is obeyed, you will not win the favour of the world. You may not even win the favour of those in church. When we read this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, it does turn out, doesn't it, that impressive words um, and even impressive people can actually be a contradiction of what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. That is, they are impressive in that they gain all of the small rewards of this world while they collapse the rewards that are waiting for us in heaven. So the fruit of that, those people um, is a deceit, but the fruit that Jesus offers is a reverence for the word of God and a heart that moves out from internal or temporal or time-based rewards and outwards to those who are persecuted those who are enemies and those who are lost. Jesus wants prophets who are prophets in heart, not prophets in their own mind. In Christian circles, like in most circles in our world, mighty works are often seen as a gift from God. But here, Jesus criticises them. Because the false are those who live a life that flies in the face of God's law, that flies in the face of a simple God-centeredness and simple other person-centeredness. So two gates, two prophets, now two houses. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I want you to notice that as Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount, he turns to those who are left. Maybe after, he, we don't know this, but maybe after he started talking about all of these things, like at other occasions, people left. And maybe there are just a few standing. But he turns to those who are left, and that is us. Those who are hearers. Of God's word. So hearing is the first step, isn't it, in doing um, Jesus' words? But don't be fooled that hearing is not the same as doing. And Jesus warns here, doesn't he? You can hear words in a way that produces doing, or and you can hear words in a way that does nothing. That's the illustration that Jesus uses. And the first one, of course, is a compliment. 